who, as we saw it, were the least seen in the office, either because they were the quietest or because they maybe worked from home often and people didn't see them very often. So that's how we started. Hmm. It makes a whole lot of sense. And the company you mentioned, I believe, co-founded by Adam Grant, if I heard you correctly, is that Givitas, like Gravitas? Or yes. what? Could, okay. Could you spell that? I can take a stab at it, but is sure. it... Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, just so people, sure. and we'll put this in the show notes as well so people can find it, but just so that people know the spelling. Yeah, so it's G-I-V-I-T-A-S. All right, we will put that in the show notes for everybody at tim.blog forward slash podcast along with everything else. If people wanted to poll their employees or ask questions of their workforce are there any questions that you would suggest? I know that that's not how you approach this. You were basing it more on the observation that you described, but are there any questions or tools that you would suggest for people who want to check the pulse of their, of their, of their team? So a couple of things I would suggest. If you are looking for an actual survey, the Gallup organization actually does polls uh, around social connection in the workplace, and you can look to their uh, questions as a, as one set of sur- as a survey tool that you could use. The other survey tool that you could use is the UCLA Loneliness Scale, which is a there are different versions of it. There's a 20 question version of it. There's also a three question version, uh, both validated tools. But that may give you a sense of how much loneliness there is in your organization. If you are looking for one or two simple questions, one of the interesting ones that has actually been found to be quite useful as an indicator in the Gallup polls has been the question, do you have a best friend at work? Mm. And it turns out that people who do not have a best friend at work, people who answer that question no, have significantly lower engagement in the workplace. And that engagement uh, is tied to productivity uh, at the end of the day and also impacts how people feel about the company and their colleagues. Writing it down. And I promised earlier, lest I get chastised by my listeners that I would ask you about anchors and remember your anchors. Could you please speak to what remember your anchors means and also describe your anchors and why they're your anchors? That's so interesting. You're asking me that. Can I ask you where that question came from, Tim? Yeah. The question came from homework. I was reading a Forbes piece Mm. and uh, Uh. the that is where the mention of anchors came up. But you can't believe everything you read on the internet. So perhaps <laughs> I have been reading an interview of Victor Lake and, mis- <laughs> and misattributing. But I'll read what I have in front of me, and we can use that as a jumping off point. Yeah. So feel no, free. I actually, I know what you're talking about. And that, <laughs> okay, was, right. <laughs> that was actually Vivek Murthy, not Victor Lake. So we're, we're on solid ground here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Perfect, so, perfect. Tim, remember your anchors is is a piece of advice that I developed to remind myself, actually, of often when I was in residency. And, you know, when I was in residency training, it was a really intense experience for me. I was both, you know, dealing with life and death every day. I was seeing people who were gravely ill, who were my age, uh, and who very well could have been me. I was also, though, trying to figure out a lot of stuff in my own life. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I was kind of going through yet another identity crisis of trying to figure out, do I want to be a doctor 100% of the time? Do I want to be something else? So I was trying to figure out a lot of stuff and I was dealing with a tumultuous sort of intellectual and emotional experience. And in that very unsettling, ungrounded uh, time in my life, I found that what I really needed was some force that would ground me in my life. And I began to think of those as my anchors, uh, the forces that would keep me tethered, that would make sure that I didn't float off, you know, in these moments of hopelessness and worry and anxiety. And those anchors ultimately were people in my life. They were my mother and my father, uh, my sister. Um, They were a few close friends, like my friend Akhil, who was my roommate in college. Uh, These became my anchors. And what I what I tried to force myself to remember in the years that followed, well after I finished residency, is that I need to be keep tracking, keeping track of 
whether or not, you know, I'm remembering those anchors and reaching out to them and staying connected to them. Because at times in my life where I have felt anxious and worried, the times where I felt just lost, frankly, um, of which there have been many, including very recently, um, those moments are often when I've lost touch with the people like in my life, the people who uh, are really the ones who know me almost better than I know myself, the people who can remind me of who I am, even in those moments uh, when I forget. And I, I want to say that last part again, because that to me is a true uh, definition of, of a friend. And this came from somebody that I spent some time with uh, in college on an overseas trip to India to do HIV work. And in one of these like late night sort of philosophical discussions, I just happened to ask him, I was like, hey, hey man, what do you think real friendship is about? And he said to me, just pause for a moment, he said, a real friend is somebody who reminds you of who you are even when you forget. And that has stuck with me. And those people are our anchors. They're the mirrors that we need during moments in our life when our vision is foggy and we can't really see uh, our way out of the fog and we don't know who we are. We don't know where we want to go. We're just lost. And so anchors, to me, those are people. Those are relationships. That's what we've got to hold on to regardless of what stage of life we're at. It is easy for me, at least, to forget who I am. It's easy to lose lose the plot. Uh, and there, I suppose there are probably shared characteristics that typify the the episodes in which that's most likely to happen. You mentioned a recent experience of feeling lost. What was that? What happened? Or what 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 caused that feeling to come up for you? Well, it was when I ended my my stint in government, when I was no longer a surgeon general and I was back to being a, a, a civilian and I was trying to figure out what to do with my life. That was a time of real difficulty for me. I was, I was lost. I was lonely. I was probably depressed. I was unsure if I had any value to contribute to the world. Uh, and if I did, I was unsure how to actually, I was unsure how to actually deliver that value. Um, it was a really hard time. And, you know, part of it was that, and I even told myself this during my time in office, I was like, I'm here as a custodian uh, of an office and I, I'm the custodian of the office of the Surgeon General, but the Surgeon General is not my identity. That's not who I fundamentally and intrinsically am as a human being. It's an office that I'm occupying. Um, but despite all of those sort of warnings and admonitions, if you will, like there was still sort of a, a shift in identity um, that had happened to me when I was in office where I think almost just by, perhaps by necessity, you know, we, you know, I, I don't want to say we, I should say I like took on the, the trappings of that role and, um, and came to identify very strongly with it. And I wanted to be a good shepherd for the office. I wanted to set the office up uh, to be stronger for the person who inherited it after me. I wanted to do those things, but it became kind of part of, of who I was. And when when I was no longer Surgeon General, which happened, I mean, if we're being open here, it happened in a fairly traumatic way, um, which I'm happy to delve into if you'd like. But when it happened, it was... Um, it was it was difficult to sort of process all of that. And um, there was a part of me which felt like because I no longer occupy that office that somehow people wouldn't want to engage with me or maybe they wouldn't think that I had any value to add the word to the world or maybe the same very things that I had said back then if I said them again would somehow be less valuable because they were not coming from somebody who held that position. They were all of these thoughts, often irrational thoughts that were uh, going through my head. And... And it was really, really hard, Tim. It was one of the loneliest times I've had uh, since my, my childhood. I want to ask you how you found your way through that or out of that, the things that most contributed. Uh, and certainly, I mean, there there's, might be a component of regression to the mean, but I, I would love to ask you about pieces of the puzzle that, that you found particularly helpful for getting through that period uh, but just so my listeners' minds don't 
run wild with all sorts of uh, imaginative scenarios. Could you could you speak briefly to why the transition was so traumatic? You don't have to share, of course, any detail you're uncomfortable sharing, but uh, I, I do think a little more context would would be helpful. And uh, frankly, I'm also curious myself because you and I haven't haven't spoken about this. <laughs> no, we haven't, Tim. Yeah, so I'll tell you. So. The office, the Surgeon General is an unusual appointment in government in that it, even though it's an appointment made by the president, the term does not end when the president leaves office. So the vast majority of political appointments will end uh, on January 20th when the new president takes office and you submit your resignation letter and then you move on and you give the new president the opportunity to appoint their people. That's how it works. But there are a few positions where that doesn't happen. They are called term appointments. So you're given a four-year term, and that may run into the next administration, uh, but you, you, you serve that term, uh, but you still serve at the pleasure of the president. So if the pre- new president comes in and they say, you know, I've got my, my own person that I want to appoint and I would like you to step down, then, you know, then you make room uh, for the new person. Um, so and the Surgeon General is not the only position that's like this. The FBI director is another. There are several, like in, in the federal government, that have term appointments. Um, In my case, what had happened is that my term technically ran until December of 2018. Um, There was a new administration that started in January of 2017. And, you know, for various reasons, you know, I I knew that it was a possibility I might be asked to leave. Um, And, you know, if it came to that, you know, I wanted to, you know, to make room for the president's pick. But the way it sort of happened was... uh, was a bit surprising to me because there was, it was one of those things, there was really no discussion sort of about it. Um, often there is, but, um, and it was sort of in the early days, you know, probably four months in, three, four months into the administration where things were still a bit chaotic. People were finding their footing and figuring out the building. So one day I, I had a meeting at, I believe it was three o'clock on a Friday uh, in April. And I was supposed to be meeting with, um, with one of the assistant secretaries Uh, And I walked into the room and the assistant secretary was sitting on the side, not in his chair. And I was surprised, but there was somebody else sitting in his chair. Um, And he said to me, he said, well, you know, as of three o'clock, you know, we are going to terminate you unless you resign right now. And I was puzzled because the same person who was in that chair had actually I had had meetings with him before and he had said, hey, we're really excited to work with you on your opioid initiative because the opioid epidemic is a big problem. It's a bipartisan issue. And we know you've been doing a lot on the issue. You've been, you know, leading a lot in the country on it. And we think this is going to be an area of collaboration. So I was thinking to myself, well, yes, you know, it would be great to work together on that because it's still a huge issue for the country. So I was gearing up to keep working on, on the opioid crisis. Um, so I literally did not expect that message, nor did I expect it from this person. Um, and so I looked at the clock at that moment and it was three Oh seven. And I said, wow, it, if I was being terminated as of three o'clock, then that means that I'm already terminated. So I guess, I guess there's no point to having a discussion, but he seemed insistent on trying to get to get me to resign. And so it was this sort of awkward back and forth where I said, well, you know, I, I respect the president's you know, decision of the president would like to, you know, like me to move on to bring his own person in. I said, but it feels like it would be inauthentic for me to resign and try to claim that, uh, you know, I wanted to spend more time with my family or something like that. That's just, it didn't feel authentic. It didn't feel like it was real. Um, and I said, you know, with respect, if you want to pursue a termination and if you want to appoint your own person, then just do that. It's within your rights. Like, like, there's no one's going to question that. It's fine. Um, and that's how I left. And so it was abrupt. I never had a chance to say goodbye to my team. And I didn't have a chance to kind of, you know, process, you know, what all of this meant. So it all happened very suddenly. And I remember going home and I, you know, had a few minutes to pack my belongings into a box and I got into a cab and started going home and you know what my first worry was that popped into my head on the way home was what are we going to do for health insurance for our baby boy sounds like a difficult 
difficult ride. It was. It was. Yeah. It was. And 